Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. think we could just start <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to get started or <laughs> yeah absolutely i do i burp directly into the microphone <laughs> how you doing i'm fucking tired i worked for Same. five minutes now it's time to take <laughs> a break that's my song yeah i'm so tired i worked for 11 years you straight. did work for 11 years i just for our listeners, I am a hero. Was trying to be a nice person, so I volunteered for a COVID vaccine distribution shift at our local university snap, today. Snap. I can't really snap, but I'm snapping for you. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. They did not tell me it was 11 hours. 11. And then they sent an email out the day before that was like, hey, uh, yeah, so be here at 6 a.m. And I said, why though? <laughs> and so then we stayed for 11 full hours and now I'm drinking like a World War I soldier who's about to have a doctor come cut their leg <laughs> off on the field, on the battlefield. And you got yelled at. Then I got yelled at by the volunteer coordinator. And I, I'm a huge teacher's pet, so when people don't like me, it disturbs me on a deep emotional level. Even this person that I've never met and will never see again. But you had to ever. pee. I had to pee so bad, and she got mad at me. I'll get mad at her. You're lucky there weren't more problems, because I have IBS. This could have turned into a whole day thing. (laughs) I had one time a coworker um, who didn't like me, and it was, like, so obvious. Like, this is when I was teaching, and the kids knew that she didn't like me. I don't know what to do when people don't like me. I was just, I don't know why. Like, I don't know what, I mean, I I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea, <laughs> but I'm like, at least I'm water for most people. You're a like, lot of people's fine. cup of tea, though. People like you a lot. No, it's okay, but she hated me. I think they do. I like you, and that's all that really matters. She was like, obviously Ew. annoyed when I walked in the room, and I was like, okay like I get it and I try to be nice to her you know when you're like oh maybe you could like me but then I'm like do I like you like you're kind of a dick dude that's exactly what happened to me and this lady today because I was like oh well I did this extra thing would that make you like me and she was like still a dick to me and I was like well fuck yeah, you yeah that's then, what I ended up doing but I just was like no right well fuck off then and also I was there because I was trying to build up some positive karma because yeah, in the age of our Lord COVID, yes. When I was 17 to 25, I did a lot of stupid shit, and I feel like i got to make up for some of that karma-wise. I can't attest. And so I was there <laughs> trying to be a good person, and this woman's taking me off my good person A game. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, I'm happy you did it. I mean, that's still cool. I'm also happy, but here's the thing. I just kept thinking about it, and I was like, if I were to become now, like the Dalai Lama... Would that really make up for what an asshole I was in my late teens, early 20s? Is it possible? I don't think you were an asshole. Mm. (laughs) Okay. I don't think so. I know you at the time, and I don't think you were an asshole, and I know other people at that time, and they were assholes. Other people, I think, at the time think I was an asshole. I know some assholes. (laughs) The other people that you know probably... Well, were they at? Do we even want? Do we even like them? Do we like them? We need to reestablish. Do we even want? That's them? the real question. That's the question. <laughs> That's the only one that matters. Do I even like you? That was a hard learning lesson for me. I think you need to take it with you. Do I yeah. even like you? That's exactly what uh, Doctor Beeson said. He was like, "Stop worrying about what people think because not everyone's gonna like you." <laughs> and he's a very likable man. <laughs> we love Doctor Beeson so much. We're like, well, Doctor like, Beeson I'm said, sorry. "Who told you that they?" <laughs> didn't like you (laughs) you're very likable i know the nicest man in the world yeah he's like hi i cure cancer and train other doctors on how to be better people (laughs) in my spare time and i'm like sorry who said they didn't like like you like what what those people are dicks. yeah i don't want to meet those those people are leech 
Dick leeches. <laughs> Dick leeches. I was a 20-year-old <laughs> alcoholic. If somebody didn't like me, eh, it kind of makes sense. But not him. He was... <laughs> no, he that was, man is after You remember afterwards you were like... You were like, did you love him or what? And I was like, I did love him. I called you and I was like, I'm sorry. Is he our new (laughs) co-host? I love him. He's such a good... I talk about him like... Every time I say Dr. Beeson said to someone who doesn't listen to our podcast, which if I'm talking to you and you don't, shame on you. You're not going to hear this, but shame on you. And so every time I say like Dr. Beeson said, like... The guy that was on your podcast, and I'm like, yes, he's my new life coach. Yeah, I lo- I literally felt like a better person for talking to him. Absolutely. Speaking of feeling good and feeling better, feeling good. Your, your wedding celebration is coming up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How, how's that going? Oh, I mean, I know I'm... how it's going, but why don't you tell our listeners? <laughs> Listen, I am already married, and like... Mm-hmm. So the wedding, it's like now it's kind of an annoyance <laughs> because like <laughs> I I think hindsight, I would have canceled it and just gotten married in the backyard. Listen, your backyard wedding was absolutely lovely. It was very intimate and very sweet. And I feel like it was really special. I did almost fall. So I'm glad I get another chance. What? When? I almost busted my no, ass you did not. in the grass. Everyone oh, was few. facing Nancy, thank God, and I said, I said Oop, almost fell. No, it's it'll be fine. I think, like... It's going to be lovely. Not having it, you know, it it's very much less stressful than it would be because yeah. I don't care. Because like, the, the stressful part is already over. Yeah. Like, the food will be good. The DJ will be good. We will look good. Mm. As long as people are fed and entertained... They're going to be happy. And we're not going to do a coffee bar because I don't care. I will have a coffee I don't bar care. Stop caring. for you and for the bride's team. Thank you. That's all I've ever asked. <laughs> On the day of your wedding, <laughs> I come you to worry. you and I say, where is my coffee? <laughs> <laughs> but I just like, Listen. I'm like, whatever. And there'll be alcohol. Yeah. That's all that matters. If you feed people and you have good music and there's alcohol, like, what are you going to complain about? I just fed you. Yeah. Love that. (laughs) How are your cats? They're um, fantastic. The girl cat is losing weight, which has been a long struggle for us. She's very conscious of her body. (laughs) Not to fat shame her. And we're in an era of body positivity and you do what you want to do. But my cat was medically obese and the doctor said, get her on a diet, please. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, okay. She was mad, right? Yeah, she would come home. Well, I would come home. She doesn't have a job, so she would never come she home. She would come home from work, right? always. From her cat job um, that she totally has. She's not a fucking bum, whatever. <laughs> and so she would. I would come home, and I would feed them, and she would snarf her food down so fast that she would immediately throw it up because she was like, you're starving me, woman. <laughs> so she became like a binge and purge type of cat. Oh, and I was like a binge and purr. <laughs> ah, ah, That's what I'm gonna call my cat weight loss program. <laughs> binge and purr. purge. <laughs> yeah, so just a binge and binge really is what I want. That's okay. my vibe. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about Sigmund Freud. I hope I'm saying his name right. What is up? Yeah. Do yeah. you know about him? Kind of. <laughs> you probably know more about him than I did when I started looking at. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay so he's him. the yeah he's the father of psychoanalysis and attributed as one of the founding fathers of modern psychology but it's important to note this all you psychologists out there fucking relax don't at me <laughs> he is not considered the father of psychology because what he believed is like taught the same way that what the founding fathers of america like are taught as so it's like what they did back in the day but like we don't do it now yeah okay you know like like what they did someone to what they did then and now let's move on to this modern yes there's been we've moved forward yeah it's like they started something but we don't acknowledge it as the people that we like listen to today they're not the be all end all because they're problematic like i.e racism and slavery and classism and When I mentioned him in another podcast episode, my wife, Michelle, was so annoyed I didn't know about him because she was like, you mentioned Freud. And I was like, I don't know who that is. (laughs) Classic. Because I think I just mentioned him like in passing. Like, and he said this. I think it was about um, 
I think it was on conversion therapy. Sometimes we're experts and sometimes we just say things and you can't, you never know which is which. <laughs> uh, I like quoted him as like saying something about conversion therapy, okay. but I don't know. I didn't know his life. Now I fucking know a lot about him. So. Okay, perfect. Expert. So I looked into him because she was annoyed with me, and he is a freak. He's a freak. Okay, perfect. He is an Austrian neurologist. He started a new approach to understanding human personality. He's highly regarded as one of the most influential and controversial individuals in the 20th century within the field. So let's start at the beginning okay. with Sigmund. He was born May 6, 1856, ew, in the Czech Republic, and he is quoted as as saying about his own birth, I recall an antidote I often heard repeated in my childhood. At the time of my birth, an old peasant woman had prophesied that my proud uh, to my proud mother that with her firstborn child, she brought a great man into the world. This man loves himself so much. Honestly, he the did. audacity. That is some... He loved himself. Like, he thought he was really the shit. He really did. Yeah. Uh, to just have, like, a fraction of it. Go on. I know. So his dad was a merchant, and then he moved the family to settle in Vienna. And Freud went to school in Vienna and, like, kind of basically grew up there. When they Mm -hmm. landed in Vienna, they lived in, like, horrible apartments. And his father never again had a full-time job. Mm -hmm. This was seen, like, as a failure to Freud, who, like, remembered his father without fondness. He did not like him. He thought he was, like, a shitty person. Um, like a waste of space. Ooh. He was also, his father was 20 years older than his mother. Okay. No shade, but damn. I, I mean. <laughs> he had already been married twice before, and the children from his first marriage were older than Sigmund's mother. <laughs> oh. Ew. Okay. His mother, his mother loved him. Sigmund, not his okay, father. fair. Um, and fo- and like really focused on Sigmund because she thought he was a genius. He mm-hmm. did super well in school. And there's this story, like he, Sigmund had other siblings. And there's a story about one of his siblings, I believe it was one of his sisters, was playing the piano and like taking lessons. And Sigmund would complain that it was distracting him while he was like studying. So his mother stopped the piano lessons from his siblings because she so cared about Sigmund. Okay. So that's how she felt about that. And that's where that strong white male energy comes from. (laughs) Also the strong love of your mother, maybe. I'm just saying. He had a lot of shit. And it will explain a lot. About how his... Whatever. Go on. (laughs) Tell the people. It's also said, like, in documents that his father, like, molested Mm. his children. And Freud wrote about the actions of his father in some of his later letters. And that really connects and, like, makes sense when we kind of talk about his feelings on sexuality and its impact that we'll see him produce work Mm -hmm. about. And how he felt that childhood influenced adult lives and shaped who we are as people. That feels like a really traumatic experience, and I feel like that's going to play a big role later, right? Yeah, he's definitely, like, he didn't have a great life as a child. Yeah. Like, his mom fucking loved him, but he <laughs> they lived in, like, shacks. Like, mm, run down, okay. like, what, what, what were the Jewish ghettos in Vienna? And they mm-hmm. moved from apartment to apartment to apartment. Like, he, he didn't have a good life, and so... And his dad was maybe molesting him. Rough shit, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I I believe, like, the there's multiple okay. documents that were uncovered that said that, so I mm. think that probably mm-hmm. did happen. Yeah. So he had, like, a lot of trauma, and that kind of, like, guided his science yeah, and research sense. and doctoring, but it was, like, kind of, like, a, wild, a willy-nilly, like, I have an idea, like, go <laughs> straight ahead and not, like, I have an idea, let me found this in fact. It was like, nah, I just have an yeah. idea. I have this idea. Go on. He okay. felt that, like, anxiety came from trauma. That's probably true. Kind of agree with that. Go on. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like, yeah, I can get on board. Same story of my life. But, <laughs> but his thing was that there is, like, a hiding we do internally from our consciousness, and that causes problems in the future. So we're hiding mm-hmm. right now, and his what he was saying was we're hiding the trauma from ourselves and our unconscious mind. Mm-hmm. And we can rarely give a true account, according to him, of our motivation for anything because we're deceiving ourselves. Okay. So I took philosophy, right? So Sigmund's (laughs) way of thinking really reminds me of the way that I felt 
in philosophy where I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you are talking in circles, and yeah. I don't even know. I can't even get to the point. Like, did you take philosophy? I took philosophy, and I thought it was bullshit. And my family's Irish and Catholic. Like, I'm so repressed. Like, my family is repressed, right? So he's like, Hi, we hide things from ourselves. My family hides everything from everyone. They just push that emotion way down. Yeah. <laughs> That's what everyone in my family does. So... I get it. I get it. I yeah, get the vibe. I think that makes sense. But I don't think that was like a groundbreaking idea. Yeah. Also, I think most of philosophy. Yes. It's like nerdy Jesus talks too much. <laughs> that's that's every philosophy class I ever took. A hundred percent. And in like psychology at the time, his peers mm-hmm. were like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, this is not a crazy idea. Now, he's about to get crazy with his ideas, <laughs> but he was not. This was. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> this was the normal idea. Okay. So he went on to study medicine in 1873 at the University of Vienna, and then he went on to work in the Vienna General Hospital. He began treating hysteria with Joseph Brewer by using the recall of painful experiences under hypnosis. So there's Mm. a story about a turning point in his career, and it's called The Case of Anna O. That happened while he was studying under Brewer. That's his teacher. So Mm -hmm. Anna O. is actually not named Anna, so I don't know why Mm -hmm. they called it that. Her (laughs) name was Bertha... Pampion. <laughs> Did I say that right? Pam. Pam. Pap. Pap. Pappin. Pap. Pam. How do you say that? That's so disrespectful. Pa- Pappenheim? Pappen- Pappenheim is so correct. <laughs> you know, when you see, when you hear the word correctly, then you can never remember why you said it. In- pa- Pampion? Who the fuck am I? I'm thinking of Pamperin. <laughs> That's being Pam- an, Pappenheim. Being a real Ampa, Anna O. Ampa. God damn it. <laughs> so Bertha was suffering Cut it from all hysteria. Out. No, leave yeah. it all in because that is real. Okay. <laughs> um, hysteria is a condition where she exhibited like physical symptoms of paralysis, convulsions, which having those at the same time make it make sense, mm. hallucinations, <laughs> loss of speech. All of these things with no physical cause. So it's not like she was having a seizure. She was just, like, having these things happening. Yeah. So Brewer was successful in treating her because he taught her to recall forgotten memories of traumatic experiences. Now, I'm going to say this. According to him, he was successful. (laughs) Because some of the memories that she's, like, revealing that are, are making her feel better once she's revealed them are she discovered she had a fear of drinking. Like water, because a dog drank from her glass. (laughs) That's what she said. Wow, that's a real trauma. (laughs) Yep. A dog. Yes, a dog drank from her her glass, and she was like, I can't (laughs) fucking do this anymore. Is what I can't do. Hey, Bertha, why don't you chill and get some real trauma? (laughs) Like, that is not. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's Go like, on. the idea is like, she's also, this is a repressed memory, right? So this is the worst of the mm-hmm. worst she's hidden down inside. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you're probably okay, okay. girl. Like, I'm like, Bertha, you seem fine. <laughs> <laughs> Other feelings and symptoms came from, she was caring for her ill father. And that was like, more of the, the painful experiences. I don't know why she was so set on this <laughs> yeah. dog drinking situation she went through, but she was That's like, a real that vibe. Yeah. changed things for me. <laughs> Not unfair. The dog, stupid. The dad, do it. Yeah, okay. So she was only able to express her feelings during psychoanalysis, and then when she was able to explain her feelings, bam, her paralysis ended. Bam, her, like, okay. convulsions ended because she it mm-hmm. was, like, her manifesting all of these feelings in a physical way, according to Freud and, and Brewer. Okay. So through this experience, Sigmund came up with this foundational idea. Physical symptoms are often the surface manifestations of really repressed conflicts, which I just explained a second ago. Yeah. So he wrote The Studies in Hysteria in 1895, and his idea was not just connected to that particular illness of hysteria, but it was then connected across human psyche in its entirety. That, like, physical symptoms are surfacing because of other things that are happening, like, in our brains and in our psyche. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that makes sense because your brain is like, you know, it's kind of wired to think about 
like everything is being the worst case scenario, right? And that's where like anxiety comes from because we, yeah. you know, the people who exist now have evolutionarily grown to be like, well, a tiger won't eat me because I'm always thinking about it. <laughs> and that's how anxiety works. And then you like push those things down. I don't know why you use that example because you know I'm scared. <laughs> You're so scared of tigers. I forgot. I'm so scared of tigers. You said a tiger won't eat me. I said, is there a tiger coming? Is there a tiger loose? I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Scared. Now I have anxiety because a tiger drank out of my glass once. <laughs> that I would be scared. Not that is a re- Bertha, that's reasonable. Bertha, that's, that's a vibe. I mean, yeah, we your brain's goal is to protect yourself, right? Right. Protect itself. So that makes sense. It reminds me of that Criminal Minds episode, of course, where that guy was killing people because he had multiple personalities and the mm-hmm. the female portraying personality that he had inside him yep. like snapped at the end and was like, I'm protecting him. And you never saw him again. That was a vibe. I was like, can I have one? Yeah. I was like, damn, Somebody needs the whole to protect time you're like, damn, damn. <laughs> For, right? But I believe, so that I understand, that's a, that makes sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. that is a good foundational idea. And again, the community's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, good job, man. Perfect. So he then went to Paris to study under, oh God, probably Jean Charcot, a neurologist. Mm-hmm. And afterwards, he set up a private practice focusing on nervous and brain disorders, including repressed memories and the influence of sexual development on a psychological disorder. Mm-hmm. So this is where it starts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is Perfect. gonna be the weird shit. <laughs> so during that time, he casually married Martha Bernays mm-hmm. and had six children. <laughs> I went to say it like it had six children because I'll fucking never. <laughs> it's so many kids. But my mom is one of nine, so that doesn't even sound like a lot to me. Think about it like this. Do you want to have six children? <laughs> Do I want to have n- six? No. Do I want to have two? No. That's so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to pretend that Concur. I know how to pronounce his children's names. Mathilde? <laughs> <laughs> Starts with the first one. Go. Oof. Mathilde? Yeah. Okay. Jean Martin, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oliver, Ernst, Sophia, mm-hmm. and Anna. So Martha, okay. that's his wife, called him Siggy. And what do you think about that name? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love Little you. Siggy. Love you, Sig. I when Love I Siggy. when I discovered that I put it in the rest of my my words so I could call him Siggy. <laughs> However, um, so he had a hard time with relationships with women and he considered them to be weak and vain and jealous and lacking a sense of justice. Like his ner- he is really coming for us. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yo, Siggy, why don't you fucking chill? <laughs> He believed that the women's, well, the women's, women's problems stemmed from them not having a penis. (laughs) Okay. Feels like an advantage to me. I will attempt to get into that later. He also said that women are the problem in society. So not only do we have lots of problems, but we're also the problem. (laughs) Okay. Great. I literally was like, how about fuck you, dude? That's so rude. (laughs) What did I ever do to you, Siggy? And then, right, Siggy. And then there are also these other things. So there's like him hating women in his life professional life (laughs) and in fact there are like lots of letters that have him communicating with male colleagues and friends in such ways that would lead us to believe that he had passionate sexual and intimate relationships with them Mm. but none of that's our business I guess so I think he hated women because he was gay but anyway he's like women are the problem (laughs) suggestive look (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. So let's focus on this anti-women vibe for a second and get into some things I really, really, really didn't want to know. Sounds so good. <laughs> I'm about to take you through some weird shit. Perfect. Siggy believed that homosexuality in men was neurotic. So that, I mean, obviously this bitch was gay. <laughs> but, okay. It's okay. Yeah. Like, we love gay people, but like, just be gay. Yeah. Um, and he, it was not problematic for men to be gay. And this is why he came up in conversion therapy, because he was the psychologist. Mm, that people quoted. Um, or psychiatrist who said, like, no, I don't actually think you need conversion therapy. Mm. He, would, that, he was like, nah, that sounds, that sounds great, <laughs> you know. Um, because, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> but he said that being a lesbian was a gateway to mental illness. Ak, excuse me. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he said that this was because he believed only men have moral sense. Cool. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> As anyone that knows a man will say. Sorry, what, what percentage of women are serial killers? Or what percentage of serial killers are women? I guess it shouldn't imply that men are all serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> but like all serial killers are men. So can square and rectangle problem. I don't know. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so he made this theory worse, if that's possible, by saying that because there was nothing to neuter in women. Mm-hmm. That we were essentially amoral, lying, and conniving to get what we want. And due to this, we have to be guided by a father or a husband or a male mm-hmm. figure. Therefore, lesbians are loose cannons of crazy, <laughs> and they are, quote, untrustworthy and unstable. You're the most now, trustworthy bitch I know. <laughs> are lesbians in general untrustworthy? No. Do I know some untrustworthy bitches? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Square rectangle problem. Right. And it's like, I mean, what the fuck? Maybe he met one bad lesbian and he was like, made a terrible generalization. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in his mind. Don't worry. He thought that being a lesbian was curable <laughs> through this like psychoanalysis. And he went on to say <clears throat> that analysis is an erotic relationship. Therefore... He couldn't cure Mm -hmm. his own daughter, Anna, of her lesbianism because that was not appropriate because his youngest daughter and his favorite child, Anna, was a lesbian. Okay. So that's where the shit came from. He's mad. Okay. Yes. Cool. He and Anna were extremely close. Mm -hmm. Anna, the lesbian daughter, he didn't but kind of did approve of because he loved her the most. And when she was Mm -hmm. 23 years old and had established what was basically a long-term relationship with a woman, he took her into analysis Anyway, yes, that erotic analysis that we just talked about that he Uh said he couldn't use on his own daughter, he did it anyway. (gasps) Ooh. In analysis, they discussed her masturbation fantasies, which basically involved a father figure. With your dad? Yes, and her masturbation fantasies, according to her in psychoanalysis or whatever, involved a father figure beating a child who made a mistake. I.e., like, her father not liking that she was a lesbian, right? And then he took that analysis and spoke about her fantasies at a conference with his daughter sitting on stage with him. That is some rough shit. Don't worry, it didn't cure her. She spent, like, over 50 years with a woman, Dorothy Burlingham, after that, who was heir to the Tiffany fortune. So, I mean... Anna would, don't worry well, about fucking Anna. fucking great for her and Dorothy. <laughs> Do not worry about Anna. Anna is doing fine. <laughs> Anna's doing better than you, man. <laughs> don't tell me you're trying to get all that Anna money now. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That she's long-term married to the Tiffany Fortune heiress, bitch. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> That's crazy. Also, can you... Nope. Can you fucking fathom nope. <laughs> talking... Nope. I don't even want to say it. I can't. Say it, I won't. Say it, I refuse. Say it. Say no. it. Say it. Can you imagine if your dad psychoanalyzed your like sexual fantasies? That sounds fucking traumatic. Well, you know my dad, so <laughs> no. Okay, do you imagine that? Absolutely I would rather gouge not. my eyes out with this plastic <laughs> straw. Same. Firmly the same. <laughs> Anna probably would too. Anna was like also trying to be an analyst, like a psychoanalyst. So I think she only went... So this is the other thing. I was, like, reading about this. I'm like, I think she was lying to him. Like, I think she was, Mm -hmm. like, counter-manipulating him to be like, oh, I'm all messed up because you don't love me. Because you beat me when I was a child. Because I'm a lesbian. I'm about to go hit up Dorothy and fucking chill for 50 years and have money. What's up, Dorothy? Right. (laughs) What's up, Dorothy? I'm trying to be a trophy (laughs) one. You know what I'm saying? Okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Go so on. So back to his weird teachings. We were about to get really weird. First we don't get weird, and then we get fucking weird. Okay. He created this topographical model of the mind, and his focus was a comparison to an iceberg. Duh, that's so fucking basic. Like, you're nobody special. You basic bitch. But it had, like, three levels of the mind. Like, what you can see, and then the stuff under the surface, and then the stuff way down there, mm-hmm. right? Okay, we get it. Siggy, you're not that cool. <laughs> There's, like, the tip of the iceberg that's the pre-conscious that consists of what we can be retrieved from memory. Mm -hmm. 
And then there is like the unconscious in this space, the unconscious or the unconscious mind as it was coined houses the majority of the causes of our behavior, a the part you can't see, but like you have maybe it's hidden away and dreams where the pictures our minds can give us in our unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So it's like our our conscious mind could give us pictures of our unconscious mind and dreams. Okay. Basically. So analyzing thinking about dreams could be a gateway to understanding things about ourselves, he said. Okay. And this is a big part of Freudian theory. And the goal of psychoanalysis was to make that unconscious mind conscious. Okay. So bringing all of the stuff that you're trying to hide, bringing that to the surface. Yeah. I mean, sometimes... I'm like, that's a good idea. Sometimes I'm like, that sounds fucking terrible. <laughs> yeah, yikes. I would like to keep that hidden, please. Yeah, pushed it down there for a reason. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like <laughs> that. Like sometimes you just want to stay things stay buried. Mm -hmm. But he developed like a more structural model of the mind after that that included these entities of ID, ego, and super ego, like Texas trucks and small dick energy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you love that you wrote that joke, didn't you? I bet you were so proud of it when you wrote it that you laughed as you were writing it. <laughs> I literally went out to the parking lot and there's like a giant truck I've never seen before. And I was like, bitch, Small this is a Prius parking lot. <laughs> Um, but really, like, these are the psyche apparatus, according to Siggy. Mm -hmm. So they are hypothetical, non-tangible parts of the human personality. So ID is the pleasure principle. And this is satisfying the basic needs based off of our two biological instincts, eros and thanatos, which is like life or death. That's it. That's all that means. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to eat. To survive, we get hungry, we eat. Then then we die. <laughs> There's a tiger, we fucking run. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like that's ID. Ego developed, according to Siggy, from the ID. And its goal is to satisf satisfy the needs and demands of the ID in a safe and socially acceptable way. Mm -hmm. So this is so, I need to eat, I stay in my apartment and get my own <laughs> lunch. I don't go next door and be like, give me your fucking food, bitch. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's not what I do, yeah. right? So okay. like, that's, that's the ego. <laughs> Keeping your shit together in a socially acceptable Keeping way. Keeping it together so that you don't get shunned. Mm -hmm. And then super ego, or put in jail. Which also develops during early childhood when apparently the child identifies with the same sex parent. I don't I don't know why he threw that in. It seemed like he was like, and then I'll throw in a little bit of same sex parent. Like it yeah. didn't make sense. Okay. Fair. But that parent is responsible for outlining the moral standards. So that's where your super ego is developing when you're young and you're identifying with your same sex parent. Mm -hmm. The super ego creates morality principle and motivates humans to behave in socially responsible and acceptable manners based on the way we're taught with this gendered focus. By your parent. By our parent. So okay. basically the idea is like each element of our psyche makes demands on us that aren't compatible with the other two. So like conflict is going to be unavoidable, according to mm -hmm. him. You mean internal conflict between the two, between a bunch of the different things. Right. So, like, okay. guilt and fear. So, like, if I'm hungry and Michelle had sushi left over that she wanted to eat, and I was like, <laughs> I want to eat this sushi, like, that internal, that's an internal struggle with my ID and my, like, super ego. My super ego is like, you can't eat Michelle's food. And my ID is like, I'm hungry, bitch. I yeah. want to eat. Because you feel It's guilt like the and, little angel yeah. and devil, like, cartoon. <laughs> or fear, depending on. I ain't scared. All right. So to pause on this strictly okay. informative space with a not so fun fact that came out. So he's like talking about morality and he's talking about like control and socially acceptable things. He was like a relentless addict. He was smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Big yikes. That's a lot of fucking cigarettes. And then he used and promoted cocaine. Like he was a cocaine addict. Oh. He distributed it to his friends and associates, which also resulted in the occasional drug addiction. He was a drug pusher. <laughs> like Tina Fey and Mean Girls. <laughs> Always a Mean Girls reference. I'm a pusher, Katie. I'm a pusher. I'm a pusher. <laughs> also, this is why he had so many ideas, because he was on cocaine. Cocaine, yeah. <laughs> he was like, ah. That's what people on cocaine do. I don't understand why his cocaine, why he didn't realize that that was his ID and his super ego battling. Like, his decision to, to do that. Like This man is very not self-aware. No, not. Because he was obsessed with his mother, and he's like, I got a lot of shit going on in here, and I'm going to project that out onto the world. So, to somebody else, bitch, and not to me. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly not what he me. did. Yeah. Yeah. So Freud yeah. is known for his way out there theories and defending weird behaviors. Hello. And some even, like, appropriate and illegal, like, 
for example, he developed a theory that humans have an unconscious in which sexual and aggressive impulses are in perpetual conflict for supremacy with the defenses against them. And he mm-hmm. also had an idea that, like, uh, pedophilia was, like, normal. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't talk about that because I that's not true. So we're not going to get into that. Let's not. Um, no. I was, but that's what he, he was like, I think, I think what he did was he was like, I'm going to say something. I'm going to see what people say. (laughs) And then I'm going to see. I I think that's what he was doing. What if? (laughs) No, no, Siggy. And he was like, no, I just, I just wanted to see. I just wanted to know. Siggy, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your theories mystify me. (laughs) That was so good. I was in on it. Okay, go. So he lived in a a repressive society, like, especially for women. And that included, like, sexuality, obviously. Mm -hmm. So Siggy attributed neurotic, 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 (laughs) neurotic, who can read, neurotic illnesses to this repression. And he attempted to understand illnesses by retracing the sexual experiences of his patients. Everything he linked back to sex. Through this journey, he came across cases of hysterical individuals that showed symptoms and behaviors in adult age. Most of these patients reported childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So what he took from that is when you're abused as a child... You become more sexual and then sexually deviant, and now you have sexual weirdnesses now because of what happened to you as a child. Mm-hmm. Wait. You're trying to decide if you're mad about it. I'm not <laughs> yeah. mad about that piece. That makes sense to me. Okay, go on. This is when he starts losing his shit. So at first he said most mental illnesses were related to sexual abuse. Call and he called it seduction theory. But a couple of years later, he flipped the script and said that his patients' memories of sexual abuse were fantasies and made up. So he started Mm. like basically saying that people were lying about things that happened to them (sighs) and they're really just repressing their own fantasies and they're just describing fantasies that they wanted to have happened to them. See, that's not, we don't, (laughs) (laughs) we don't like that. No. Now we're mad. <laughs> now I'm that's mad. That's not... That's not... We don't... Flip no. the switch. And I'm mad. I think he was like, what do we think about this? And everyone was like, yeah, that makes sense. And he's like, well, what if I say it this way? <laughs> he's like tiptoeing over the line. And he's we'll like, take it back. Do you like this? Everyone's like, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, and he's like, well, what about this? They're like, no. He's like, no, I'm going to go with that okay, one. Okay, <laughs> well, taking it one step back then. <laughs> This wasn't actually the most controversial thing he said or did, but this is leading to it. Like, based on this theory, he concluded that the child is lusting after his or her parents and seeking bodily sexual pleasure, and that the adults were not preying on children. Okay. This is where he's defending, like, pedophilia. Because he basically was saying the children are at fault for what happens to them in sexual experiences because they're actually, like sexual beings gross go on ew he is really gross please stop sir so he has this theory of psychosexual development and it's called the oedipus Oedipus. complex and i really hope i said that right what oedipus oedipus wait say that there's an o there make it make sense (laughs) no that's fine leave it in i'll give up the o is silent The O is silent. Well, if it was silent in my last name, it would be Soswald. So that's <laughs> stupid. <laughs> so Siggy believed that children are born. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> I think Oedipus, whatever. Just take off the O. <laughs> Why is it there? So Sigmund, why is it there? <laughs> Sigmund believed that children are born with a libido. And that there are a number of stages of childhood in which the child seeks pleasure from a different object. Mm -hmm. So, not all of this is gross. I know you're prepping. Your face is prepping for gross (laughs) shit. Some of it, like, kind of makes sense. And then it gets weird. Okay. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So, I'm just going to list the psychosexual stages here because they sound really gross. I actually took human sexuality, so I know these. Go on. Okay. Oral, anal, phallic, latent, and genital. Mm -hmm. At every stage, we have to complete it, and then we'll be, like, psychologically healthy, according to Siggy. Yeah. Apparently, we can also get stuck at stages and not progress any further. So if we resolve the conflict in a stage, you can progress to the next level, and if not, you're stuck. Okay. 
So, listen, this is all, like, really weird. But he basically said at each stage there are pleasure centers in different spaces. Like, in the oral stage, like, is one-year-olds and down. And the idea is that their mouth is their libido space. Like, they're hungry. Okay. Like, they're only focused on getting food. And that's why they cry all the time and all of that. That's what he was saying. But if you don't outgrow this stage... They're also teething, but, like, okay. Right. <laughs> he was like, but if you don't outgrow this stage, you could be suffering now from things like overeating, overconsumption of alcohol and smoking, things that are... Smoking all the time? Right. So did you not outgrow it, bitch? (laughs) Or what? So that was basically the oral space that, like, they did or did not outgrow. That maybe he got stuck in. I don't know. So I'm going to skip down. I'm not going to explain all those stages because I don't want to. (laughs) I started reading Mm -hmm. them, and I was like, it sounds gross. I hate it. (laughs) So... I'm going to skip down to this Oedipus complex, Oedipus. Um, And it's called this because in mythology, Oedipus killed his father and then marries his mother. And when he realizes what he did, which, like, at what point do you realize that? He pokes his eyes out. Right. So, anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's the correct response. Poke your eyes out. Right. So, for uh, Siggy, like, really liked mythology. And he believed Mm -hmm. that every single boy, this is a weird shit, I say that like there wasn't already weird shit. This is some more weird shit. (laughs) It's just pile it on. (laughs) Every single boy is sexually attracted to his mother. And that every boy believes that if his father found out, he would take (laughs) away his penis. Which gives every single boy, apparently, castration anxiety. And boys then become their fathers through imitation instead of, like, fighting. So they're not going to fight their father. They're just going to become like their father because they want their mother. But they're afraid if their father found out they wanted their mother, they would lose their penis. Did not know it was an option to take away the penises of men who do things wrong. Did <laughs> I mean, I that is the only theory I'm like, 10 out of 10. <laughs> is that something that we're on board with as a society now? I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. Let's just throw it out there and see what the people think. We'll vote. I think it's a great idea. Perfect. He had some crazy views and opinions and participated in some wild experimental procedures too. And this was Def the kind of guy who could get behind <laughs> Turn up. a lobotomy, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's this letter in 1895 in which Siggy wrote about a procedure he was doing that made him nervous because of his lack of medical knowledge. Like, that doesn't give me much confidence in any medical professionals at the time. Hope the patient didn't see that. They didn't because his family, like, hid those letters for, like, 90-plus years. And they came Mm -hmm. out, like, later. Yeah, smart. (laughs) Smart As as they should have burned it, like, in Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. Why'd you let it? So, why'd you let it come out? That's on you, th- dummies. So also, I was why did like, you write it down? Don't leave a paper trail. <laughs> Be nervous like the rest of us, but don't write it down. <laughs> he wrote it. It's like he wrote it down, put it on his Facebook, and then archived it. <laughs> and then his daughter was like, "We can unarchive all this shit." And everyone was yeah. like, "What the fuck?" Oh, you shouldn't have so done it, that. He does not make me feel confident in any of med- medical professional at the time and we've already covered medical professionals in the 1800s and I did not appreciate them. So mm-hmm. the patient was Emma Eckstein mm-hmm. who began analysis with Siggy when she was 27 years old and she complained of these two things stomach pain and menstrual issues that made walking actually painful which heard that girl been there. Mm-hmm. Siggy and his colleague fr- attributed her pain to something like what do you think they attributed it to? It better be menstrual cramps, because that's the answer. (laughs) Nope. They said she was having all this pain because of masturbation. God damn it. (laughs) Which came to light in the psychoanalytic sessions that they were having. So this assumption was almost entirely unfounded. Duh. Like, they were like, well, you're masturbating, right? And she was like, I mean, I'm 27, like, sometimes. (laughs) Yes. And they were like, that's why you're sick. Okay. They believed... This is what they said. That girls who masturbate normally suffer from dysmenorrhea. And the only way to treat it was nasally. Or she could give up masturbation. So Siggy believed that sexual organs were connected to the nose. And that sexual issues like masturbation. I'm watching your face. (laughs) Because you said up the nose. And I was like, did they give her a COVID test? Oh, you had flashbacks. Yeah, I did. PTSD. No, that they're all connected to their nose. Mm-hmm. So, like, sexual issues like masturbation were causes of neurotic 
neurotic. Why do I keep wanting to say neurotic? <laughs> Maladies. And that can be solved with a nasal, a nasal surgery. For a bit of light in this weird space, most of his peers were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, yeah. that makes no... We wash our hands. This guy is nuts. Stop it, sir. He was, like, potentially harmful. Correct. The operation... So they had nasal surgery on this woman. Shockingly, it did not go well. And the patient almost died. Mm -hmm. She had a massive hemorrhage, a bone chip the size of a coin, and like buckets full of pus that were as the result of the surgery. She survived, but like it doesn't sound like it was a walk in the park. I, the only thing I'm surprised about in this scenario is that she survived. Yep. Because he also wrote in his journal before he started that he was nervous. <laughs> do you he know wrote it in I a letter do? to somebody. A letter to someone. So he told somebody already, do you know what I would do if my doctor said that? I would sue them for malpractice. I'd be like, bitch, you were nervous? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, this is, I was just like an example. And he knew like at that point he was way out of his depth. Like, first of all, I was practicing medicine because it paid the bills. He wasn't practicing medicine because he wanted to. Like he yeah. wanted to be some sort of weird science mind guy. Um, okay. So he knew he was, like, not qualified to do that. He's, like, he's like has a little mask on while he's doing surgery, and he's, like, fake it till you make it, Siggy. Fake it till you make it. That's exactly what he was doing, talking to his ID and ego. <laughs> Muttering yes. to himself, and they're, like, what? What did you say? <laughs> so he also Nothing. spent time dabbling in writing, and he published a piece of work, The Interpretation of Dreams, where he analyzed dreams in terms of unconscious desires and experiences. And he said, it contains the most valuable of all the discoveries it has been my good fortune to make. Insight such as this falls to one's lot, but once in a lifetime. So he's like super proud of this book. He explained. Mm -hmm. In addition to that major work on dreams, he wrote other things, too. The most notable being the psych psychopathology yes, of yeah. everyday life, totem and taboo, civilization and its discontents, and the future of an illusion. He wrote about psychology, literature, and religion, too. So he, like, thought he was cool. Obviously. He was diagnosed eventually with cancer of the jaw. Oof. In, and in, uh, in 1923 and went through over 30 operations and eventually passed away. Um, in September of 1939. And that's Siggy. Can I ask one question? <laughs> the people who did those 30 surgeries, were they nervous? <laughs> I bet. <laughs> were they nervous before they did that surgery? Did they write down, I'm very nervous about this facial surgery I'm about a, to do? wrote a letter to their friend. He was like, I'm fucking nervous. That was interesting. I didn't know a lot of that. I didn't want to know a lot of that. And now... I wish I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I said. Siggy's a very interesting character. And I'm going to say it again. I think that a lot of his problems seem to have come from his childhood. Yeah. And it feels like he's projecting a lot of those on the rest of the world. I think he should have just stopped know. with that one theory that he was an mm -hmm. example of and really thought that one through. And left yeah. alone yeah. all of the other weird shit where he was like, I don't think I'm about yeah. to take this a step further. Someone should have been like, no, no. Time out. <laughs> Sorry. Pause. That's why you have to have one. You have to have one honest friend on your side who will be like, listen, Siggy, can I call you Siggy? You've taken it too far. <laughs> That's exactly what he needed. We all have that one friend. I have that friend in you. I'd be like, hey, you stop. Talking, stop saying pedophilia is okay. Yeah, start there, Siggy. Stop it now. It's not. Stop doing that. Yeah, but that's <laughs> what I learned about him. That was super interesting. Thank you. Loved it. Hated it. Loved it. Yeah, exactly. It's the, the two-edged <laughs> sword here at Malpractice Podcast. As always, thank you for listening. Yeah, check out our social meds. Like and subscribe. I know that's not what it is. It's just subscribe. Right? Yeah. Subscribe, leave us a review. Yeah, only if it's good though. Don't leave us don't leave us any shitty reviews. I don't want it. Yeah, don't be a dick. We don't want to hear that negativity. <laughs> <laughs> don't be a what is it? A dick leech? It's time to call this. Chop. Call this dick leech. <laughs>